In this video, I'll review the forces that stabilize DNA double helices and briefly go over the different factors that impact the melting temperature of DNA. The three main types of forces that stabilize DNA structure are base stacking, base pairing, and ionic interactions. These forces are present in both DNA and RNA. Because of the drive to protect hydrophobic regions from water, Base stacking interactions are the largest contributor to the stability of a DNA double helix. When bases are stacked on top of each other, the bases attract each other through transient dipole-dipole interactions induced in the electron clouds on the surfaces of the bases, as well as because of partial charges on certain functional groups in the bases. Though any base pair can stack on any other base pair, the strength of the interaction between the bases differs depending on which bases are involved. There are 10 different possible combinations of base pairs in a dinucleotide of a double helix, as shown in this table. Just to make sure you're clear on what the letters mean, I've drawn a simple representation of the CATG dinucleotide. One strand reads CA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and the complementary strand reads TG. With that in mind, we can look at the results of experiments done to measure the strength of stacking interactions between the 10 possible dinucleotides. These researchers designed nucleic acid strands to be in equilibrium between the stacked and unstacked forms, and measured the changes in Gibbs free energy shown in the table when the base pairs stacked on each other. The most favorable interactions were between the GC-GC dinucleotide while TATA had the least favorable interactions. Further, when you compare dinucleotides containing only GC base pairs with those containing only AT base pairs, you can see that on average, GC base pairs have more favorable stacking than AT base pairs. This is the main reason why GC rich regions are harder to denature than AT rich regions. It's not because of the hydrogen bonding, but because of base stacking interactions. I mentioned that bases have partial charges on certain groups. These partial charges are represented in this diagram. The strength of base stacking interactions depends on how the partial charges and the hydrophobic regions interact with each other. I want to use this diagram to try to show why the GCGC dinucleotide has a different stacking energy than the CGCG dinucleotide. This is something that often puzzles students. These dinucleotides are not equivalent because the double helix has a right-handed twist and the base pairs do not interact with each other in the same way. So here I'm showing the GC-GC dinucleotide. You have to imagine the backbone going 5' prime to 3' prime towards you on the left strand and 5' prime to 3' prime away from you on the right. If I reverse the dinucleotide and make it CGCG, keeping the same right-handed twist, you can see that the partial charges are positioned differently on the top diagram than they are on the bottom diagram. Therefore, the interactions between GC-GC dinucleotides are not the same as those between the CG-CG dinucleotide. Now, I don't expect you to be able to predict which dinucleotides will have stronger or weaker interactions based on this type of diagram. I'm just showing it to give a sense of why different dinucleotides will interact differently. The second type of interaction is base pairing. In DNA, G always base pairs with C, A always base pairs with T, and vice versa. The bases form hydrogen bonds with each other, which holds them together. Shown here are the standard base pairing configurations first predicted by Watson and Crick, with two hydrogen bonds between A and T, and three between G and C. Note that the bases could form hydrogen bonds with water that individually would be about the same strength but there is an advantage to forming multiple hydrogen bonds between the same two molecules, the advantage of cooperativity. The third major type of interaction stabilizing the double helix is ionic interactions. The phosphate groups on the backbone are negatively charged, and these are spread out. Cations will bind in between the negatively charged groups to shield the charges from each other. Note that one or more water molecules will normally be positioned between the cation and the phosphate group. 
The magnesium ion is particularly effective at stabilizing the double helix because the water shell that it coordinates is exactly the right size and geometry to fit nicely between phosphate ions. These forces that stabilize the double helix can be overcome by heating the solution. At some temperature, the two strands will start to separate. This process can be followed by monitoring the absorbance at 260 nanometers, uh, which is higher for single-stranded DNA than double-stranded. So for any double-stranded DNA, absorbance will increase with temperature as the double helix denatures. Note that denaturation is not instantaneous, but happens over a range of temperatures. The temperature at which half of the DNA is in the denatured state is called the melting temperature. I want to quickly review the factors that influence melting temperature of a DNA double helix. The longer the helix, the higher the melting temperature. GC-rich DNA melts at a higher temperature than AT-rich DNA, and because of difference in base stacking interactions, the exact sequence matters. Introducing mismatches between the bases lowers the melting temperature. The presence of organic solvents in the solution also lowers the melting temperature, while adding salt increases it. And finally, DNA is less stable at extremes of pH because of changes in protonation of the nitrogenous bases. Now, people have devised equations to try to predict the melting temperature of oligonucleotides, which can be helpful when designing primers for sequencing, blotting, or PCR. The simplest equations consider only length and GC content, while more sophisticated equations take into account concentration of salt and organic solvent, and the exact sequence of the oligo. You're not responsible for memorizing these equations, but it's helpful to understand basically how they work. And this brings us to the end of my discussion on DNA stability. In the next video, I'll move on to talk about flexibility within the DNA double helix.